Hi, this is your host, Swadhin Bhartia. We are here in Paris at the LF Energy Summit. And today we have with us once again, Anna Hermansen, your ecosystem manager at uh, LF Research. Uh, Anna, it's great to sit down with you again. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. And you touched upon this briefly uh, at the Open Source Summit that you folks were working on your next report. So, uh, so talk about the the report that you know we uh, like you folks are announcing here at the event. We recently published this week a report called the Open Source Opportunity for Microgrids, um, that came out after a few months of collaborative process with FutureWay and with other researchers and advisors in the microgrid sector, where we wanted to ask the question: What is the state of open stand open source when it comes to the microgrid sector, which which players are implementing open source solutions and how might open source solutions benefit the issues or obstacles that the sector is facing. And also at the same time, what are obstacles to implementing open source as we see across the board when we, when we uh, research open source in multiple industries. So this report was published this week and we discuss um, uh, you know what are what is the state, and then also what are what does uh, what does open source represent as opportunities in this space? So, what kind of business models does it enable? What kind of interoperability does it enable when we're talking about different technologies in a microgrid, and whether or not those microgrids um, can can talk to one another? Um, what kind of cost reductions and barriers does it lower? So there's there's a lot in there. It's quite a dense report. There's tons of information um, on on what the open source opportunity is in this space. Is it possible for you to explain what exactly is microgrid and how different is it from the, the grid that we know of? Is it the same thing? Is it a subset? So it's a subset of the larger electri- of the larger electric grid. It represents a number of interconnected loads that is distinct from the electrical grid and operates as its own entity. It has interconnected resources such as solar or uh, geothermal energy that are stored in a battery. And then that energy can be used at a certain time by an individual. And so it, it really it represents a new, almost democratic way of organizing and generating and eventually distributing energy. Can you give any real, you know, real life examples where people get, oh, that's what microgrid looks like? In our session today at the LF Energy Summit, we had an individual give a keynote about how he started a solar panel system on his roof. And so for him to work with his neighbors to build out a solar power uh, on their roofs, they create a system where they can generate energy through solar, they can store it in a battery, and then they can eventually share it amongst themselves and their community. Excellent. Thanks for explaining, you know, what microgrid is. Can you also talk a bit about what led to this creation of microgrids? Of course, if you look at it, the way we are interacting with electricity has also changed. It's no longer a waterfall model. You know, we, just like, you know, uh, media, right? We don't just consume media. We are actually putting more uh, p- pictures and videos through our iPhones on TikTok and Twitter and Instagram. Same with electricity. You know, we have solar panels, we have batteries, we have EVs. We are putting a lot of electrons back into the system. So talk about the whole origin and evolution of microgrid considering this change, you know, dynamics. Yeah, I think it really gets back to this idea of democratizing energy. And we've seen in my lifetime, we've seen solar and other forms of renewable energy really expanding, becoming cheaper, becoming more accessible. And really the everyday person could consider using renewables, whether that's from their electric vehicles or heating their home through solar, um, using wind turbines on a farm. So there's a lot more accessibility around renewables, despite still having a high cost that cost has lowered. And so there's there's that element of this uh, new kind of system around microgrids. But then there's also the idea that, um, you know, for example, I spent a few months in Europe this winter. And especially in Europe, there is a lot of conversation around how to democratize energy and how to how to be less reliant on this larger electric grid where we get energy that could be disrupted given geopolitical issues. So having less reliance on a major electrical grid also is really pushing this this space. And I think is also a big reason why we did this research is to understand as we move towards more of a microgrids market in 
developed and developing nations, um, you know, understanding where open source plays a role in this could really help push that space even further and further democratize access and distribution of energy. Is microgrid a kind of individual level project or is there also a kind of, you know, ecosystem market there and where we can actually talk about once again, like any other market, doesn't matter what it is, you know, once again, uh, how mature the market is, how <laughs> they are like building the software, is it hardware, the challenges, all those things. So let's start with uh, with that aspect. First of all, when we look at microgrid, is it an individual level project or is it kind of a new emerging market? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, the 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 transformation to microgrids really represents a disruption in the energy sector where we don't have just that one generator and distributor. Um, you know, for example, you could if you had this you know, that this keynote presentation today, he has this solar, like kind of independent mini solar farm where he can store, generate and store his energy. And so um, if you look at that from more of a market perspective, how do we build out a market around this individual actually becoming his own distributor of energy? And so that requires a complete disruption of the regulation and policies we have in place that where we'd have to build out how this individual could actually sell energy and what kind of money he could receive for selling that energy. So I think it's there are a lot of individual projects around it and it is individualistic right now in the sense that I could build a, um, you know, a, a charging station for my electric vehicle at my home and that's kind of a one-off. But I think looking forward, as we move into a space where microgrids are more common and we can build out these mini villages of energy, it really represents an entire market disruption around the distribution and generation of energy. Excellent. Which brings us to your report also with opportunities which are there for open source. So mm-hmm. I also want to talk uh, that what was your methodology for this research? Who did you talk to? Yeah. And, you know, some of the findings. We partnered with the Intentional Futures, which is a research and um, content man- generation group out of the out of San Francisco, and they supported us on research with 17 different subject matter experts in the microgrid space. Um, quite a few were from kind of more uh, incumbent energy groups. We had some inter- interviews with Shell, with and also with RTE and Aleander. Um, so some of these groups were did have an eye into open source, but a lot of them um, really pointed out the nascency and the the immaturity of open source in this space. So um, a big part of our research became around the idea that uh, you know this this space is quite young, and so how do we how do we almost market the ideas and the, the, the benefits that open source can provide to this space? Um, and still, of course, provide it um, in a rigorous research report that demonstrates a bunch of different perspectives around the benefits and also the challenges and costs that come with with focusing on on open source. You talked about you know that open source in this space is at a very early stage. Any any other major findings that were there? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this really ties into the larger uh, issues and challenges we see in the energy space. But we have these really big players and these energy incumbents that are still quite uh, there. There is a knowledge gap around their understanding of open source and um, what its benefits are and how to implement it. And there are some financial costs around doing that kind of transition to open source. And so there is uh there is very much a conversation around how do we better educate um, grid operators and utilities and also policymakers and regulators around the benefits of open source so that we can create a system that better supports you know, the, the, um, this process of microgrid development and instead of supporting this more centralized grid infrastructure. But, you know, like I was saying earlier, there's really a major shift in this mindset around how to build out energy infrastructure. And a lot of it rests on um, on education and, and data sharing and collaboration, which is partly why open source is such a useful useful tool in this um, in this process. Perfect. Thank you. Now, if you look at microgrid, as you were earlier talking about, you know, that is kind of emerging space, does that also mean that we will not have to actually 
uh, deal with all the challenges that comes with the traditional players because you know it is all software driven also so so do you feel that uh, things will move a bit faster with this whole micro grid emergence versus traditional player yeah i think that's a really interesting question you know we see often in technology when things are young they can kind of disrupt things a lot quicker um but there, i think the the challenge here is that we're still within a market that has these very large players that are quite steadfast in what they're choosing and microgrids has have exploded but there is still um maybe not resistance, but there's less focus on the open source model in this space. And so I, I think we're still seeing a bit of, um, of lack of understanding or openness to adopting open source. But um, I was just speaking to someone earlier today who has a, a startup in microgrids, and he was sharing more about you know how they could start looking more at open source processes and tools. And so I think... I think the the immaturity and the the you know the nascency of this space does allow for a bit more contemplation around how do we build this out in a way that that really supports modularity, interoperability, standards development, so that it's a really strong industry. When we look at you know these kind of studies or reports, of course it gives us an insight into where things are. At the same time, it also helps us in 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 finding ways how we can help the industry and ecosystem. So if you look at this report, and of course, there are organizations like RT, Aliander, which are doing a lot of open source, LF Energy, you know, it came through the core contribution through uh, RT and Aliander. When you look at this report, how do you think that it might help these players, uh, LF Energy, Linux Foundation, to better understand the situation and they can learn something and actually go back and help folks? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, as I said earlier, our, the report is quite dense and I mean that in a really good way. There's a lot of information in there and a lot of perspectives in there from different players. And so I think, you know, it's a really honest take and a really, um, a really well-researched take on where we are at in this space. And we provide five really valuable value propositions so that individuals reading the report can take those back to their to the organizations they work for to just have a conversation about, you know, why we would want to look at open source in this space. Um, I think that's that's the main that's the main thing with our research as well. Like I spoke about yesterday, being able to provide some knowledge translation around around the research we've done at events like this is so useful and impactful. But the other the other useful point of me getting on stage and speaking is that I can remind individuals in the audience that there's this huge repository of open source insights that is meant to be used by this community to to take back to their organizations to advance the adoption of open source. So I think for for a microgrid um, organization or for a larger energy player, there is a lot of insight in there into how to develop an open source microgrid, but also um, how to better support this space and and how to take a how to take a look at open source when um, you're considering whether or not you want to adopt it. Uh, you mentioned five propositions. Can you talk about those? Propositions. Yeah, so the, the first value proposition is around accessibility. Uh, this can be financial accessibility and also knowledge accessibility. Open source is oftentimes a cheaper alternative to proprietary and closed source. And it also generates a resource and community of knowledge where individuals can go and learn more about technology. The second value proposition is around microgrid design. And so this um, the, the open source model or ethos really supports more modular and interoperable systems. And so building out an open source microgrid uh, opens the, uh, the community up to different types of designs that can interoperate with one another. The third piece is in interoperability, so is related. Again, this, um, you know, this open source focus on consensus and collaboration brings everyone to the table around standards development and technology development that can talk to one another. The fourth is in market innovation. Um, open source builds out new business models and different forms of innovating that, again, brings individuals 
or from different industries together to collaborate. And the fourth is the diff- the fifth is the different kind of business models that uh, open source provides. And so again, getting back to this idea that there are different types of microgrids, there are different ways of building out a business from the open source perspective and applying those different open source models allows for a more kind of creative and more um, um, diverse uh, model for, for microgrid businesses. We did also publish one other research report uh, this past week. That's the t- 2023 State of Transformation Readiness. And in this report, we partnered with LF Energy and we surveyed utilities on their understanding around open source, particularly as it relates to the our ability to transition to cleaner energy and also how it can support our, our, our meeting of our, our carbon targets more effectively. Um, And so we summarized these findings into a report and we found that um, our survey respondents, which were utilities, are very aware of the the benefits that come with digitization and how it can support more um, energy efficient processes such as more dynamic demand response, electric vehicle charging, um, you know, smart home management. And a lot of these survey respondents also do have um, a plan in place to digitize and already have it implemented. But again, we do see challenges around concerns around performance of open source software, uh, the security and reliability of the software, and the types of vendor support available. And so there are some opportunities for growth in this space where we can fill those knowledge gaps around the the real security and reliability of this software that, that we know and we all use in this space. And also, how do we make sure that that vendor support exists when individuals, energy incumbents, take on open source software to transition to to cleaner energy systems? Anna, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, share uh, these findings, these reports. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again when you come up with the next report. I would thank love you. that. Thank you so much. Thank you.